This morning I'm fired up about this message that we're about to receive. You know, oftentimes, you know, uh, you, you you hear it said, I guess, that, you know, uh, you know, I'm called to preach or I'm called to this uh, particular aspect of ministry, and the, and the truth of the matter is you don't have to be saved to write sermons. I mean, you can do a research paper on the Bible and write down whatever opinion you might have of, of what you got, and, uh, and, and that's not what's going on this morning. This morning, what I want to talk about, what I'm going to try to do this morning is uh, I'm going to talk and, and answer the question, what does God say about giving? We're, we're going to continue to talk about finances. I've had elders just really chastise me that I'm not giving you enough information about how to handle your money. And so in the last few weeks, we've done that. If you hadn't listened to the messages, I think they'd be amazingly good to help you with your finances. We're going to talk about that again. But what we want to discover is what, what does God really say about giving? And I want to answer the question, should I give out of guilt or a response to pressure from a preacher? I want, to, I want to talk about, is he more concerned with the amount of giving or our heart? What's, what's he talking about when he says obedience is better than sacrifice? Is he talking about money there? Is the tithe a New Testament idea, or did it pass away when Jesus came? What's the difference between a tithe and a free will offering? I want to kind of get into some of these things and see if I can help answer that. But to do that, I want you to understand that, that even when you start talking about finances, your finances, which always in, in, a, in a congregation like this, when, when you say that word, people go, oh. I mean, you can feel the air leave the room if you're on stage. You're like, oh, my gosh, the air just left the room. Hope these people don't pass out. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is we have to understand when our finances, we just saying to God, how great is your love? And so how, if we believe how great is your love, God, why do we set finances outside of that? You know, we need to just move your money right into how great is your love, God? Right? We, we, when we think about the finance aspect of life, we, we, we take away the idea that God didn't come so you won't go to hell. We, we don't even think like that. I mean, God did not come. Jesus did not die on the cross so you wouldn't go to hell. Let's just really make that real clear. He, he died on the cross so you could be restored into relationship with the Father. Yeah. Right? And that includes your finances. Because then you become a child of God, a child of the king, an ambassador of Christ, the one who's emulating kingdom in everything you do, which includes, includes, includes how to handle your money, right? And so, so let's don't avoid it. Let's, let's really check it out. Let's ask some hard questions. Let's, let's see if we can discover, uh, because it's important that we do, what God thinks about money. Wouldn't you agree that's important to really understand what, what, what from a place that, that it isn't responding to pressure or guilt? So I, that's what I titled the message. I titled it, Should I Give Out a Guilt or a Response to Pressure? And obviously the answer is no, you should not. Because that's not the heart of God. That's not the heart of God toward giving. It's, not, it's not, the, not the posture he wants you to have. Everything about our lives is positioning ourselves before God. You know, you're going to position yourself. What's the position that God asks about finance? So let's, let's, just, let's just jump on in. So is God more concerned about our heart when it comes to giving? Do, do, do you think he is? Well, the first thing that he asks us to do is he asks us to tithe. Tithe means tenth, which means bring 10% to the storehouse. Now, if you, if you talk to a financial planner, he would suggest that you bring 10% to the storehouse and that you save 10% and that you live on the 80%. You know, that you pay God what he asks, you give God what he asks, and then more, and then you, and then you save, and then you... Do whatever you can out of the access. So an, what's the, so an offering is anything above the time. Does that need to come to the storehouse? Well, some of it probably does. 
some it probably does, but an offering can go anywhere else. Any, anybody that has a need, anybody that you see has a need, maybe you know somebody that the struggling this month paying their electric bill or you know what, whatever it might be, you see them struggling to eat or to take, you know somebody with five kids. I promise you, you got somebody with, with a bunch of kids. It ain't going to hurt their feelings to get $40. You know what I mean? They're not, you know, it'd be good for them to, to get a little extra, you know, to help. So that, that's, that's kind of what, what, you know, being generous and bringing offerings in. And then there's a, there's a free will offering. You know, I love the place in Exodus 35. We see this and we wonder about the, is the heart important? Look, look at what it says in Exodus 35. Now, he's not talking about the tithe, he's, he's talking about building the tabernacle, which we're about to do. We're about to build this building. I want you to just see the heart of God in this. Moses said to the whole community of Israel, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. Say that with me. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. He didn't ask everybody. He didn't put a burden on you. He says, if you've got a generous heart, you do. Right? Okay. And then, and then he goes this. He says, bring gold, silver, and bronze, purple, pur blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat hair for cloth, tan, ram skins, and goat skins, leather, arcadia wood, olive oil for lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and other gemstones to be set in the ephod and the priest's chest piece. Come, all of you who are gifted craftsmen, construct everything that the Lord's commanded. What's really interesting about this, he says, he, he, he gives you all these things, and, and the thing that gets lost oftentimes in this is that those are the way that they, you know, exchanged money. They, there was a, a major bartering system that go to, went on, and, and that's how you identified wealth. You didn't have a savings account. There were no 401ks. There were no IRAs. There was gold, silver, fine linens. You know, there was material wealth, you know, sheep, goats, cows. How many cows you got? I got 100. Well, I've got 20. I'm working on 100. I've been praying for the bull. <laughs> That's funny right there. All right. Now that I got you back. Wealth is the material stuff. And God asked them to, to give from what they had out of something that had value to them. You know, you know, you know if you've been around me long that my pet peeve is to bring a, a, a washing machine to the church that, that, that you wore out and you want to get you a new one, and so you're going to give your old one to God. That messes me up, I'm going to tell you right now. I'd rather you keep the old one, go buy a new one, bring the new one to God. You keep the old one or take it to West Stanley. He can use it. He'll turn it into cash. Right? But they brought things of value to the Lord. And what's really interesting to me, these were poor people. These were slaves. And they've been slaves all their life. Not only had they been slaves all their lives, their mama and daddy were slaves. And their grandmama and their granddaddy were slaves. And their great grandmama and their great granddaddy were slaves. These were poor people who when they left, when they left Egypt, God gave them a, a bounty. He, he collected an offering from the Egyptians, right? He depossessed them. And so these people hadn't had any wealth or anything of value their whole life. Now, all of a sudden, they got it. And then God says, give it back or a portion or whatever your heart will allow you to. You see, God, in, in, in what he's trying to teach us is, is that, that everything, he, he, everything comes from him. He, in his word, he said, hey, man, I own it all. You know when I really got a hold of this? When my mom and daddy died and Liz's mom and daddy died. 
It was, you know, anybody been through that where your parents go on to be with the Lord? You know, Liz grew up in a house from, I think it was 1969 she moved in a house, and it was, it was the neighborhood in Greenville to live in. It was a nice neighborhood at the time. It's still a nice neighborhood. It's a very nice neighborhood. But then there was not anything hardly like it. Now they're building mansions everywhere. I don't know how people are living in them, but they're building them everywhere. But anyhow, in this case, this is where she grew up. And so it had tremendous uh, uh, emotional value, you know? This, there were so many memories in that house, so many Thanksgiving dinners in that house, so many Christmas events in that house that, that just meant so much to everybody. And then, and then when the dad died and the mom went on and went be with the Lord, they, there was an estate sale. And they, and they sold everything they had out of that house. And then, that, and then they sold the house. And now some other family lives in the house, and Mama and Daddy are dust. Now she did pass an inheritance on to the grand, I mean to the children. And, and, they, and, and they will pass an inheritance on to their children. But it's not hers. It's gone. Whatever. My daddy worked for Furman University for, for years and years and years. And when he retired, he got a watch. He was a Hall of Fame football player at Furman University. And his name is on the wall. He's, his picture is in a restaurant <laughs> in, in Greenville. But there's going to be a time when nobody's going to know who Roland Barefoot was. Because we're all going to be gone and nobody's going to know. And who's that guy in the picture? That's when it really... It just really came home to me that, that it ain't, it's not mine. I'm going to be dust. And, and then God, God has said, hey, in relationship with me, I, I, I want to love you with your finances. I want to show you who I am through that. If you'll just position yourself, kingdom. In Samuel, there's, there's a story of Saul, and Saul is given the instruction by Samuel, I want you to go in this city, and I want you to, I want you to <laughs> which is interesting. And you have to understand that the reason God did this is he was sanctifying the children of Israel. He was setting them apart, so he didn't let people who served idols survive. So God says, I want you to go in here, and I want you to take this land. I don't want you to keep anything. You can't keep the bounty. You can't keep anything. Destroy it all. And Saul says, okay, I'll do that. So he goes and he does it, and then Samuel comes back, and he hears the sheep bleeping. And he says, what's that I hear? And, and this, is what, this is what Saul said. He said, Man, he said, I, I did exactly what the Lord told me. Except I thought it was a good idea that we keep a few of these good lambs and we make a sacrifice to God. And that's when Saul was depossessed de of the kingship of Israel. Why? Because he, he thought... He thought that his way was better than God's way. If you ever think that your way of dealing with and looking at finances is better than God's way, you might have a heart problem. You might have a heart problem. And so you really better examine your life, making sure that it aligns with kingdom because it does measure. God, you know, think, think about this rent. God says it's impossible to serve God and to serve money. You've got to do one or the other. So there is a distinguishing by God of those two things, right? So you better find out what he says. Would you agree? If you listen, if you just play ignorant, which you're not going to be after this message, it is it still does not have the ability to bring kingdom. 
God loves you. He wants to bless you. He wants you to prosper in your financial ways. And it doesn't look the same for everybody. Everybody is not gifted the same. We're going to see that in just a moment. But you've got to make sure that your way doesn't trump God's way. And so, is God concerned about the heart? Yes, but he's also concerned about giving. Because you give out of a right heart. You give out of an understanding that his grace is sufficient for you in your finances. His power working in your circumstances can do more than you can do on your own. His grace is sufficient for your finances. And you either believe that by the way you do or you don't. And you don't believe. You say, you say I believe it in my mind. Or if I ever get ahead or if, I, or if my financial, you know, the poor decisions that I've made in the past, if I ever get healthy from that, then I can align with kingdom. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And I'm going to show you God's principles in that too. So, does, so, so I'm going to ask the question, does God ask me the tithe, and did Jesus abolish the tithe? So we already know that, that the kingdom of God requires obedience, because that, and, and your way of doing what God asks you to is not the way he asks you to. In the Navy, this is, what, this is the single thing. Well, I learned that I never want to go on another cruise. And the second thing that I learned... <laughs> Everybody says, oh, have you ever been on a cruise? I said, yeah, quite a few. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. And, and I learned how to, how to submit to authority. You see, in the Navy, it's no more, no less. You hear it all the time. When you get a command, when you get an order, it's no more, no less. You do what you're told. Now, let me just give you a scenario. You're in the COC, which is the, the operations center where the captain sits and all the people that are firing guns, they sit in this same place that got the radar and all, all the things that are going on. And that's what I did. I sat there to, at the five-inch guns on the front of the destroyer. That was my job. And to fix all the radar stuff in between. Now, if you sit there and somebody says, duck, you don't look around to see if you need to make a decision whether you need to duck or not. Or you're dead. You're probably decapitated. You get, you're tracking with me? When somebody in the COC says duck, guess what you do? You duck. Right? I learned that kind of thing. When God says, this is what I want you to do, then you respond to that, right? Then he's got principles in his word that he's saying, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. And he has so many of them about your finances. He's asking you to respond and position yourself like he wants you to so that he can do what he wants to. And he's waiting on you and me. He waits on us to position ourselves rightly so that he can do righteousness, so he can pour out. That's what he does. So the kingdom requires obedience. And another thing that I want you to understand when we think about this tithe is that, that God is looking to see if you will align yourself with his way in finances. You know, oftentimes, and we understand this, I guess, I don't know that we live it out very well, but I think we understand it, is that God doesn't have a rating system with sin. Do, do you understand that? I mean, like, this sin here is a three, and this sin over here is a seven, right? Well, I think some of us understand that, hopefully all of us do, especially now. But I want you to understand something else. He doesn't have a rating system to righteousness either. It's not, it's not this righteous act is a three. This one here is a seven. This righteous act here is a ten. No, it's either righteous or it's not. It's either aligning with kingdom or it's not. Right? And so God is, he is looking to see 
if you're going to align yourself with righteousness. So, so let's answer the question. Does Jesus ask me to tithe, now, or did he abolish it? Now, this is Matthew 23, 23, and this is Jesus talking. He says, he says he's talking to the Pharisees. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the, the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes. Say that with me. Who said that? But do not neglect the more important things. He's he's saying right here, he's not rating it. He's just saying all of these things you need to focus on, and you need to focus on these, and they're more valuable kingdom expansion than the tithe. This, they, they will produce incredible fruit. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said, don't misunderstand why I have come. Say that with me. Don't misunderstand why I have come. Let's do it again. Don't misunderstand. <laughs> I can't even say it. Let's do it again so I can get it right. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Now, when it comes to to your finances, when Jesus died on the cross, did he abolish kingdom principle about finances? Did he fulfill it? Okay, he fulfilled the cross, but he still, he fulfilled the ability for you to do it. He, he, he says, I have broken the power of sin over your life. You can tithe. I will give you the power and the grace to respond rightly to this. That's what Jesus did. He didn't come to abolish anything. And so you got to ask yourself, you got to ask yourself, does my way trump God's way? Now, <laughs> what I do every year now, this is the preacher keeping the preacher honest. How many are glad that the preachers keep the preacher honest? How many say, somebody say, hallelujah. Look at your giving statement and see. I mean, it'll tell the truth. It'll tell the truth. And, and don't feel condemned. And, and, don't, and don't just, you know, you can, you can repent. You can be sorrowful. You can talk to God and say, God, I see. Ugh. Respond. He, he's not condemning you. He wants to bless you. He wants to pour out his love. He wants you to, he wants you to align with him. So, we understand that ge- generous giving is a display of faith that God is the owner of everything. That's what stewardship's about. Stewardship is, is a stewardship is a stepping into. I talked about it with worship and singing songs, emoting. You know, a lot of people emote about somebody else's uh, uh, experience with God. Somebody has this incredible, life-changing experience with God, and it's been very difficult. I mean, they lived a year of hellish forces coming at them, and, and, they, and they had a tough time, and, and they called out to God, and they cried out to God, and, and, and God responded to them, and God brought them hope, and God brought them healing, and they wrote a song about it, and we emote about that song, but we never step into the truth of what the Scripture says about that song, and the same is true with finances. You have to step into the truth of what God says. We, it's an act of worship and, and our faith, our, our giving, our generous giving is stepping into the idea that God, I know you own it all and you've asked me for this and you want to bless me, but you're waiting on me. If I'll do what I'm supposed to do, He'll do what he says he's going to do. If you ask me if, if so, so-and-so has a heart for, for God, I can say if they do, 
if they do, if they, if they really, 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 Kim, wherever you are with your, with your walk and your, and your vision, you know, when I ask you a question just a minute, I just ask Kim a minute ago, have you got vision? And she's, you know, she's in a kind of a time of transition. She said, not yet. And I said, are you pursuing God? She said, more than ever. I'm telling you right now, if she is, he'll be found. That's a promise of God. And if you'll do your part with this, he will respond. I am totally confident. There is no reservation in me that if you'll align yourself with kingdom with your money, you'll be blessed beyond measure. How? I don't know. I don't know. Probably won't look like me. Probably won't look like Dennis. It's going to look like what God has for you. And it's better than what you're doing now, unless you're giving generously. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ask or think. And so we move into a place that we understand that generous giving is that display of faith a heart of faith, a heart of worship, a heart of obedience, a heart of generosity, and that produces results beyond our expectation. We've got to move to a place where we remove the excuses that cause you to believe you can't give, especially that excuse that says, if I had more, I'd give. That is the devil's tactic, and and I can prove it. I can prove it. And I can also prove that stewardship is rewarded. Matthew chapter 25. This is a story about Jesus coming to the, he says, hey, let, me, let me just read it. So, so it doesn't lose anything, and so you know it's just not me, okay? I'm going to read it square, straight. It's a lot of scripture. I'm going to read it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his, his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags. Somebody say five bags. Five bags of silver to one. Two bags. Say two bags. Two bags of silver to another. And one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. This is Jesus talking. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who who, uh, received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they used his money. And the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in in handling this small amount, so I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave two bags of silver to invest, and and I've earned two more. And the master said, Well done, my faithful, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you more Many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came in and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. They were mine. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, if you knew they were all they were all his, it was just a bad perspective. Why don't you deposit my money in the bank, and at least I could have gotten a little bit of interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those of who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. Everybody say abundance. abundance. There it is again. But for those who are doing nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Interesting story, isn't it? Listen to me. 
Listen to me. You need to understand which one did the Lord rebuke? The one with the least amount of money. If you are saying, I'm going to wait until I have more, you are him or her. Because it's the one with the least that gets rebuked. When, when the woman came and put the offering in the offering boxes, Jesus said, that woman right there, She's given more than all these rich people. But she because she gave out of her lack. She gave out because she didn't have anything. She still gave what was valuable to her. And so I just want to point out that you've got to make a decision that you are going to change your posture and position of your financial life and align with kingdom. And so let me get rid of this idea that it's Old Testament versus New Testament, that Jesus abolished. I, I still want to hit that, and I'm going to hit that with Malachi. Malachi chapter 3 is always taught in Scripture uh, when it comes to tithes and offering. Um, and, and it's the last book in the, in the, in the uh, Old Testament, and there is a huge gap between when Malachi was written and when Matthew uh, actually comes on the scene. In the New Testament, Jesus is born and dies on the cross. There's, there's many hundreds of years that are in between there. And, uh, and so, and, and, and oftentimes, you know, ah, there's just, just this false gospel that wants to do away with the Old Testament. So anyway, I, I won't go there, but I, I'm going to go here. Watch this. This is Malachi chapter 3, and, and I went back to verse 6 because I want you to see it all because it is the gospel. Are you ready? You ready for the gospel and the Malachi? Here it comes. I am the Lord. Say this with me. And I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are, that is why the church are not already, this is not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Being disobedient to the law has always been a problem. I'm just pointing it out. Now return to me, and I will return to you. Say that with me. Return to me, and I will return to you. Do you see what I've been trying to teach for years? That if you'll do this, God will respond. If you return to God, God will be there. He is rebuking these people for not doing what they should. And all his request is, he doesn't want to, he didn't want to condemn you. He doesn't want you to be condemned. He wants you to be blessed. And he's saying to you, if you'll line up with me, I'll come. If you'll line up with me, I'll be there. I'll show up. I'll show up on the scene. Ever since the days of your ancestors, I've scorned, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I'll turn to you, says the Lord of the heaven's armies, Jesus. But you ask, how can we return? We have, we've, we've never gone anywhere, Lord. I mean, I'm saved. I'm the church. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When do we ever cheat you? You've cheated me of the tithes and offerings to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple, so there will be enough provision so I can carry out kingdom from, from the church. If you do, says the Lord of armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will, I will pour out blessings so great you won't even you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant. Say abundant. For I will guard. And that's their, that's their finances, y'all. Where 
Where am I? There it is. For I will guard them from the insects and disease. Your grapes will not fail, fall from the vine before they're ripe, says the Lord of heaven's army. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of, of, of heaven. It's armies. You've said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the, the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich, and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. What, if you go back, I started in verse 6. Go, go to Malachi. If you've got your Bibles, tur turn with me. Chapter 3. Did y'all get all that? All right, listen to the first part. This is chapter 3. You ready? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Capital M. John the Baptist, Jesus. Chapter 3, Malachi. Y'all tracking with me? And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a, lauder, a launderer's soap. He will sit as, as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, the church, the priest, and purge them as gold and silver. They may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of, of Judah, Israel, the church, and Jerusalem, the church, will be pleasant to the Lord in the days of old as the former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and winners and so on and so forth. Y'all, the first, y'all, church, the first part of this chapter is talking about Jesus. Whether you believe that it's talking about his first coming or whether you think he's, it's talking about his second coming, it's talking about Jesus coming back and catching you doing your finances kingdom. He said, be careful. He says, I'm coming. I'm coming. And it's going to be, and, and, are, and you're robbing me. You, you need to stop. You need to repent. You need to come back to me. You need to align with me because I want to bless you. I want you to prosper. See if I won't pour out heaven on you. If you align, why? Because he knows if you align your finances, you're going to align everything else. If you serve God and not your money, you, if you understand that it's his and not yours, that he's the owner and you're the steward, when you get a hold of that and align yourself with that, that is what he wants to burn off. He wants to burn off those, those areas of sin and, 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 and disalignment with his kingdom in your heart, in your life, and in your motives. And he wants you to align with kingdom because he wants you to live the abundant life. He didn't come to kill, steal, and destroy like Satan did. He came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. He wants you to... I could, get, I could get people to come up here, and we probably need to do this sometime. But when they made a decision that they were going to align their finances to God's, they were able to live on half of what they used to live on. They were able, they were able to not only live the way they, they guarded, they, they hoarded. I mean, they just protected their money. This is Mike, whoo, like a three-year-old. Mike, Mike. That might. That might. But getting got freedom. And it's just started coming. And they're like, wow. What's this? Not only am I free here, but I'm 
being blessed. I got abundance coming. Wow, I'm amazed. God wants to do that. That's the, that's the call. The call is, the call was, you come back to me and I'll meet you there. It's the same story of the prodigal. The prodigal wanted to do it his way. Runs down to the pig pen. Finds out, says, even the servants in my father's house have it better than this. Came to his senses, wanted to align himself with kingdom, started coming home. He Was he home? Was he home? He was not home. But what was he doing? His intent was to get home. Right? The father saw him coming. Come on. Somebody say hallelujah. The father saw him coming and ran to him. Met him on the road, restored him, had a feast. Abundance began to happen that day. Healing happened that day. Freedom happened that day. That's the request of God. You don't own nothing. You're a steward of kingdom. And finances is part of that stewardship. And you're going to be... You, 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 your relationship and, and how you posture yourself is highly dependent on how you handle your finances. And Jesus did not abolish the tithe. And he certainly didn't abolish the offering. He actually wants you to be more generous as he pours out on you. You see, the, the plan of God is to find somebody he can pour out on that'll give it away. That's God's, that's God's desire. I talked to a brother this week, one of the elders, and he was talking about how he was trying to, to create more tributaries of income that would gather in the reservoir of God so that he could then pour out on everybody else. And I thought, oh people would just get that if you guys could come that'd be great there, there's there's no place to go I, 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 listen listen I, I really want you guys to hear hear my heart on this as as your pastor and as your leader i mean i'll be glad to show you what i gave this church last year i mean if you want to see my tithing statement I'd be glad to show it to you. You just got to show me yours. Okay? All right. I'll be glad to show it to you. Because there are very few people in this congregation that outgive Liz and I. So I'm not one that is, I'm not preaching from a place of, I'm not preaching to you. I'm not preaching down to you. I live this. But let me just tell you this. I have to examine my finances on a regular basis, and I'm failing in so many different places. It's something that you've got to bring to God. You can't just do it once and it's, it's done. You constantly have to continually position yourself in submission to the ways of God so that he can show you his plan. It's not, you, you can't steward God's stuff with your own decisions. He does want you to think. He does want, but he, he wants you to be in relationship with him. He wants you to, he wants to give you prophetic words that so-and-so and so-and-so is struggling right now. If you could drop them a hundred, that would, that would help. I had somebody in here put $1,500 in my pocket so that I could give it to somebody that doesn't even go to this church. And I had a lunch appointment with that individual and, 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 and was able to bless them. And I did not reveal anything about who gave it because the Lord put it on their heart. That is generous giving. And it met a need. This guy just busted. He was desperate. He didn't know where he was going to turn. He didn't know how he was going to feed his family. He didn't know how he was about to be evicted. He didn't know what he was going to do. And God brought him a 
couple months' rent and food. It's more than the tithe to the storehouse. It's more than the offering to the storehouse. It's a lifestyle of stewardship that allows God to pour more on you so you can give more away. Help us develop kingdom thinking when it comes to money, Lord. It's not about building a church. This is not about building a building, although it is. God says, those of you who have a heart, bring the stuff of value. He does say that, and we're saying that. It's a place. It's not the only place. Amen? Father, help us understand kingdom when it comes to money. You know, it, it, it is, it's, it's so misrepresented, God. Money is not the root of all evil. <laughs> you use money, God. It can be the root of all kinds of evil if we don't have our focus on you, if we don't have our position right with you. So the word of the Lord this morning is for those of you who don't tithe, which about, I, I, we're, we're about, we, we have about, I, I did the numbers the other day, we have about, we're 200% of the average church in tithing. This church doesn't have a tithing problem, but, but everybody does. So if you're not one of those, I, the Lord I'm telling you right now, the Lord is saying, align with me. Test me on this. If I won't bless you, I'll bless you. And for some of us, we need to open up. Listen to me. Listen to me. You really need to hear this. God, and I'm going to pray it over. We need to open up to tributaries of ways that God can bring extra money into our situation so that we can give more. We're not believing big enough for God. We're not really coming to God and saying, give me, give me creative ideas that you can increase my abundance so that I can steward what you bring me to advance the kingdom. And you need to just open your mind and say, God, I've, I've, I've limited yourself to my capabilities. And I really need to open up and allow you to bless me like I never thought. My mindset has limited me because of how I see me, not how you see me. Father, in the name of Jesus, wherever we are, God, my desire as the pastor of this church is to never manipulate, is to, is to never try to misrepresent your desire for our posture to line up with kingdom to advance my own. But Lord, I don't want to shrink back either of teaching the possibilities of your great grace and your great love for us. Bringing into our lives supernatural abundance. So I ask God, that each one of us would examine how we're doing and adjust. That's what you say. That's all your word says. That's what it says when it means repent. It just means adjust. Align yourself. You come back to the way I said do it, I'll be there. I ask you, God, that you would speak to us all. I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said Amen.